Where are you, Josh? I'm in Brooklyn, in bed Oh, nice. Yeah. I used to live right off of uh, the Grand Army Rotary on Silver Terrace, right off, right by the uh, library. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah. Did you go to that library a lot? Like, I, I find actually that- would. I would go chill there every now and then. Yeah. 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 It just seems like one of those places where, I don't know, it, it it's a very, like libraries have become a very specific thing because it's not, it's yeah. obviously not that we don't need them. They do a lot of community outreach and stuff. But yeah. if you spend a lot of time in a library, especially like a public library as an uh, adult, you, things usually get like weird, you know, yeah. like, like yeah. it's. It's like it it it's serving this other weird purpose where it's like yeah. lots of people are like taking naps and yeah. a, lot, a lot of is going on. It's a lot of just interneting on the computers, people who can't get online otherwise, and yeah, people taking naps and an occasional book. Yeah, yeah. Occasionally, <laughs> someone will check out a book and bring it back, which blows my mind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't people, believe any library ever gets their book back. Yeah, or people will come back to pay fines because they found a book from 27 years ago. Yeah. Like, you know, I owe $43.24, and I, I'm like, who can I pay it to in cash, in nickels, you know? Yeah, it's also one of those things, like, not to, you know, you never want to be a jerk, but, like, you don't really have to pay the fine. Like the fi- like the fine is only if you want to keep up this relationship. Like like <laughs> yeah. when you go to a library and you're like, hey, I I checked this book out like three years ago. I never read it. I forgot I had it. And then I just want to do the right thing. And maybe some you know eighth grader wants to read Catcher in the Rye, so I just brought <laughs> yeah. it back just to do the right thing. And then just they're in case like, you didn't well, have any other copies of it. <laughs> yeah, just in case you only had one copy this whole three years, uh, I, I brought it back. And then the library will be like, well, sir, that and then they start calculating. Like I'm like, I'm gonna pay it. It it's like I only need to pay this if you ever see me again. Like, like <laughs> clearly I shouldn't be checking out books from the library because I don't bring them back. And then when I do bring them back, it's been like a new administration, you know, like a like yeah. a new, a new whole life has started like people have had kids in the time that i borrowed this book and so then they're like oh it's like 47 58 and it's like that's that's wild i'm not gonna pay that and then you you try to just leave the book but they're like sir you have to it's like i don't but i don't (laughs) like like i don't think we understand the things that we do and don't have to do and like, yeah. and it, because there's a, there's a social contract of what makes you a jerk or not. And violating it sometimes is, is worthy. It's like, like whenever the best example I can give, um, uh, I would, where was I, I was at this like uh sandwich shop and as they were making the sandwich, I just realized how nasty the sandwich was going to be like every new step. <laughs> I was at this, I think I was a Quiznos or something. Every new step was like horrible. Like I, I think I've even talked about it on my podcast. Like the meat was just insane looking. And it was like <laughs> they had clearly like steamed it with hot, like hot steam. Like it didn't look cooked or anything. <laughs> and so then in the middle of them making the sandwich, I was like, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna go. And they were like, No, you can't go. I've already started the sandwich. And this happened to my you friend too. Yeah. Once we get past the condiments, you're stuck. You can't, yeah. you, you know, we can't put like mustard on top of the meat because that's it. That the contracts yeah. signed and delivered at that point. And my friend, my friend had the same situation. She was at like a subway and then just what, I don't even know what they were doing, but it was just, it was getting to the point where it was like, oh, this is going to be nasty because you haven't been listening to a word that I said, so I'm just going to leave. And they're like, <laughs> no, you got to pay for this half made sandwich. It's like, but I don't though. Like, like so many people's lives would be improved if they just realized in the moment what they did and didn't have to do, you know? (laughs) Hey, y'all, welcome to this week's episode of the Stay Human Podcast. And I'm talking here with Josh Johnson. You just kind of dipped in on our conversation, which is a great way to start because... Josh's comedy, I just love so much, man. I'm I'm super honored to have you on on the show, and I've been a fan and been following you for um, a couple of years now. And uh, I love just your stream of consciousness flow and your observation is so uh, 
astute and hilarious. And um, for those of you who don't know Josh, he was recently named by Variety as one of their 10 comics to watch for 2021. And he's a decorated stand-up comic and daily show staff writer. And alongside his writing, touring, and his recently released 33-track mixtape, Josh has shared with the world just over 50 episodes to date of his own podcast, The Josh Johnson Show, which you should subscribe to. It's hilarious and always insightful. And where he's got free-form conversations about life, love, and comedy with his friend and fellow comedian, Logan Nielsen, who's also an incredible wingman and, and just hilarious. So uh, please welcome to the show. As always, we're sponsored by Gibson Guitars, and uh, we've got Josh Johnson with us today. How you doing, Josh? I'm I'm doing well. That that's all very kind. I didn't even know I didn't know about the <laughs> Gibson guitar sponsorship. I've always so here's the thing. I tried <laughs> taking up guitar like like way back in the day. And <sighs> I don't know, like, not that people can't be multifaceted, but it's very hard to bring piano fingers to a to a guitar lesson. Like, so you got I, a little bit of piano in you? Not even good. Just yeah. I got long, skinny fingers that aren't coordinated enough. Like, yeah. I feel like Gibson would be the guitar to learn on. You know? Yeah. They make great guitars, and um, the thing about playing guitar is, uh, well, when I learned. I went on this trip to Cuba in, in like 1997, and there was, there was about 25 artists from America and Europe and 25 Cuban artists. And we were tasked to write songs for a week. And at the end of the week, we were going to play them at like the National Theater of Cuba. And uh, so there was all these great artists like, you know, Peter Frampton and Gladys Knight and the Indigo Girls and Michelle and Dago Cello and, and, uh, Stuart Copeland, the drummer from the police and Mick Fleetwood from Fleetwood Mac. And then there was me who was like this random rapper, singer, producer, weird guy, you know? And so I didn't play an instrument at that time. So they were all passing this guitar around the table at night and singing these songs and followed by like Cuban bottles of Cuban rum and Cuban cigars are being smoked. And each of the U S and uh, artists were, were singing these, their hit songs, you know, and then, um, the Spanish artists, the Cuban artists, were singing these wonderful boleros off into the Havana moonlight, you know, and, you know, strumming the guitar like crazy. And then they pass the guitar to me, and, and I didn't have any idea how to play it. So I, like, take the guitar, and I just, I flip it over, and I try to, like, bust a beat on it. I'm like, a hip, hop, a hip. <laughs> and like, it just did not work at all because I didn't even have the rhythm to be able to just keep like half a little random beat going. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. On top of it. And so it, it was just foul. So I was like, I will never be caught in this situation again. So I went back home and I bought a cheap guitar and I was like, I'm going to play this thing. And, and like for three years, the guitar just sat in the corner of my room, just like haunting me. Like every time I walk in the room, it was like, you know, there's your mom who's like telling you like you haven't finished your chores or something, you know, that's yeah, what the guitar was, was going to play like, me. I thought yeah, you were exactly. going to play me. <laughs> yeah. Give me the love. Hey, man, Um, you know, our, my podcast is all about this belief that I have that there's no one that you wouldn't love if you knew their story. And so I want to learn about you. Like, where did you come from? Where did you grow up? What were, you, what were your parents like? What was your house like? Uh, You know, so I, I grew up in Louisiana and sorry I don't breathe the best so then I yawn <laughs> a lot uh so I, I grew up in Louisiana and I think that for the most part I've, I've always wondered if I didn't grow up in a different place like I I I do believe that things have to work themselves out the way that they have to work themselves out. Uh, because as much as I love Chicago and New York, I think that I did have to grow up in Louisiana to get the perspective that I have now. And just, I, I think that now I look back at a lot of things that are, are you, you could even say would be like traumatic or something. And, yeah. and I at least take in the fact that I experienced that with some, level of 
not acceptance of the the way it was because things were really messed up and everything, but I think that just the way it was in order to, to change it. Like I grew up around a lot of racism, and um, I, I think that for the most part, as much as I enjoy my life and everything, there's some things I look back on and I'm like, oh yeah, that was like really bad. And I even talk about it in in my sets now about how like, you know, the, there's a lot about life that is trauma, but both like most trauma is kind of funny. Like, like obviously <laughs> not all of it. Like that would be insane to just yeah. laugh at every, but like, a lot of it is like pretty funny. And I think that when I was growing up, I didn't necessarily have that perspective yet, but you know, I, I was living with, uh, with my parents to a point, they eventually got divorced. I think I was like, maybe I was like 10 or 11. I actually don't remember the year, but then past that I lived with like my mom and my, uh, grandparents and, Mm -hmm. You know, my grandma was always very funny, but she was also like very, I don't even know what the, what the real word for it would be, but like, I guess a bit mercurial in a, in a sense where she was like, I don't really like, she would get mad sometimes. And I wouldn't even know why this thing was setting her off, but it's also, <laughs> you, you have to put yourself in the perspective of a person that has, um, gone through a lot and is expected to stay sane and keep normal, which is very hard for I think a lot of people to do just in general, once you accumulate enough years in in life, it's kind of wild to expect that someone is normal. Like to your point, you know, knowing someone's story, it's like people will tell you things like I have a good friend who's in Atlanta, whose granddad uh, way back in we're talking like maybe 1920 or something. Uh, got in some sort of argument and was trying to walk away from it, but it was an argument with a white dude. And so uh, they got in a fight and he just stabbed that dude and left town for 30 years. It's like that type of thing is so crazy where you're like, wait, wait, wait what did you do next? What you? He's like, mm, I, I just knew I had to go. I couldn't, I couldn't stick I around and out have for a 30. chat. Yeah. <laughs> and so I just sort of dipped out for 30 years, wait till everybody might be dead. And then I came back and you know, people will talk about these things like they're like they're normal because they're normal for the time. But yeah. I, I find that there are so many like as I'm accumulating those experiences that maybe are traumatic, but then you just have to go on with life and everything. I think that I, I get more insight into how other people are. And so when I was young, I didn't particularly feel like I was good at a lot of things, like mm-hmm. just in general. I wasn't the most athletic. Um, I wasn't like I was I was smart, but to a point and in only in certain subjects, which is normal for a kid. But like, you know how looking back, you're like, man, I wish I was like a genius all around. Yeah. And and so then early on, like as a little kid, I found that my favorite thing to do was make people laugh, whether it was my mom or my, you know, mm. grandparents or any, anybody like that. I, I like really treasure those moments where I was able to crack them up and everything. And so I didn't even fully understand what doing comedy was, but I know that I, I start watching specials on Comedy Central and everything. And I remember some of the first ones that I saw that I was able to take in what was really happening past like Mm. just the joke, like someone sharing an aspect of their life or someone sharing this like this golden polished um, hour performance Mm -hmm. and bringing that to, you know, these strangers. And I found that that blew my mind so much that I was like, okay, that's the coolest thing in the world. I didn't even really think about me doing it yet. I didn't even think about like, oh, I have enough stories or like I have the sensibility to be funny or, or whatever that is. And so then, uh, you know, in college, I actually majored in design and was planning on becoming a lighting designer for like Broadway and dance concerts and all this stuff like that, which, you know, was kind of a lofty goal to to begin with. But I felt like you rarely hear about like I've even whether I was pursuing design at the time or not, I've only ever met like three successful designers, but they knew they had wanted to do it for a very long time. And it seems like a lane that 
It's not like everybody's in. It's not like acting, you know? So yeah. there are plenty of talented designers all over the country, and it's very competitive, but it's not as competitive as other fields of entertainment. Yeah. And then when I was in college, I just had this shift because I did my I did my school's talent show in high school and stuff, which was like, you know, is here and there, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I did the open mic night at my college, and that was when I was like able to really try things for the first time because even in the high school talent show there's a lot you can't say like like obviously if you there's certain things you say that you just end up getting detention if you know like if you yeah. switch it up <laughs> on the the theater teacher that's putting on the the talent show and then you're over here talking about like ah yeah y'all y'all have been banging it's like yeah you can't you can't do that so then <laughs> um in college was the first time i could talk about anything and so then that was a really interesting, that felt different and it felt amazing to, you know, it was still my friends and people that relatively knew me and stuff, but I had a shift in college where I was like, I think I'm going to move to Chicago and in Chicago, you can either pursue, pursue lighting design or you can pursue comedy. And I found that since both of them are equally unstable it mm. it basically made sense to go with the one that interested me the most that you I was love the, the most, most in love with. Yeah. And it's like, because yeah. if you're going to be broke, you're going to be broke. Like you could be homeless right. anywhere. Right. So I think that you could have just thrown in, I'm going to go into the NBA and it would have been equally as far out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it, because it was also a thing of when I moved to Chicago, like Chicago was such a formative time for me, not just in comedy because that's where I started, but also just in life. It was like my first time being out on my own. It was like me, you know, me after college, so still very young and like making mistakes and stuff, still doing like odd jobs, whatever. And yeah. and I find that so much came out of that that I try to bring to my overall New York experiences because like Chicago was wild, man. Like even, even like when I was moving there, cause you know, you're a kid, so you don't understand how. So how old were you when works. you moved there? 22. Yeah. So okay. it's like, you know, you're not a baby, but you're, you're still, you know, like this very young adult that's like, yeah. especially in America, we don't expect much from young adults, which I think is a shame because you can accomplish a lot by the time you've had two decades worth of turns around the sun. But I think that, for me, I I moved there and I remember like, so I had saved up as much money as I possibly could. And I worked at this amazing Mexican restaurant that, you know, they they took me in really when I was like 16. And so from this, 16. Was this back in Louisiana? Back in Louisiana, yeah. So okay. like from 16 to, to 22, they employed me even while I was in college. I was still like on the schedule and I would come back for some weekends to work shifts and then go back to school and stuff. And, you know, I like that, like that time in and of itself was such a, a forming time for me because it was the first time that I got to like be around people. So, uh, you know, there were cooks in the kitchen. There was the, the overall staff out front. There were the owners like everybody was so sweet and kind to me and like took me under their wing to teach me things. And some of the things were like things I should never learn. Like, so like, like there were, there were some of the cooks that were like wild out where I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> I can see why I, I can see the situation you're in. You know what I mean? Cause like yeah. some of the, some of the cooks were like on work release from jail. So then some of the things okay. they're telling me, I'm like, oh Lord, uh, <laughs> should, should you be telling anybody this? This is incriminating right now. <laughs> and so when I moved officially from, you know, Louisiana to Chicago, I, I had saved up, like I just save, 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 save. So I'd saved up all this money. And I remember trying to find an apartment because my friends were letting me stay with them. But you know, it wasn't this, like, you're our roommate. And I was like, I, right, let's, let's see what, like, let's see how long it takes you to get up off this couch, you know? Yeah. And so I remember just going to places. I thought I had given a reasonable rent amount, you know, and I, and I wouldn't try to live alone lavishly. I was fine with a studio cause I'm, I'm coming right out of college. So I basically have been yeah. living in a studio for four years with a roommate, you know? And so I, I remember they took me to this place that straight up cause, cause a realtor or an agent is going to try to sell you anything. 
But they took me to this place and there was straight up no floor. There was like, (laughs) there was no floor at all. And so we walk in and and it's just dirt and I tripped on a pipe and like it, it was terrible. And I I didn't tell this man that my that my budget was three dollars. Like I don't know why he brought me here. And then he even tried to spin it. He's like, all right, so there's no floor now. Okay. <laughs> but eventually they're gonna put some linoleum in. You're gonna be the first one with that linoleum. I was like, linoleum. <laughs> <laughs> there's like there's like rats banging in the corner right now in front of us aren't even ashamed that's how nasty this place is and so we we kept looking we looked for like maybe i think like three weeks and then i finally got um yeah i finally got a place i got this studio that was on like sheridan road in rogers park and yeah. you know it was close to the beach, and it was it it was just like I, I it's very easy to, to romanticize the times when you were slightly younger and the times where you were going through a thing, but it like all worked out. But it's yeah. very hard for me to when not, you're living it. Oh man, yeah, you're living it, you just like yeah. stress it. Because cause in the moment, I think that once I, you know what it was, once I had my apartment and I really looked around me and was like, okay, I have a job because I got a job at a grocery store um, yeah. and that job was terrible. But like eventually I started working at Trader Joe's and it was dope. But like the first grocery job I had was like rough. And even with it being so rough, I was like so, so happy. And it was it was like a happiness that I think is why I romanticize living in Chicago because it was a happiness out of nothing. It was like I really yeah. didn't have anything, you yeah. know. And I started doing open mics, like comedy stand up open mics, almost right off the plane when I got to Chicago. And so it's like I was doing these open mics at night. I didn't know what was gonna happen to me. Like I had enough to like take the bus and get from one mic to the next mic because that's a great thing about Chicago is you can just get up doing stand-up open mics like all night and yeah I, I was like so so happy and I'm still happy but like that was a very different type of thing because it was like the proof that I was happy was that I was happy because I really yeah. didn't have that much to be like happy about like it was it was like I didn't really have any I remember that same stage or anything. Yeah, for yeah. the same stage for me, I had a, I, I moved into this uh, three bedroom apartment and uh, one of my roommates was uh, a black Vietnam veteran who was uh, sort of, uh, I guess, part time Coke dealer. Mm-hmm. for like professional athletes <laughs> so i'd be like what'd you do this weekend he'd be like oh man i was chilling with the 49ers doing blowout at this place and we and so you'd, you'd have all these far out tales of either vietnam or doing blow with professional athletes and um and then i had these other two roommates who were lesbians who were into s m and we had one bathroom and so they would hang all their s m gear in the bathroom like they'd wash it and then hang it up so there'd be like strap-ons handcuffs stuff like that and and in my room i had i had nothing it was just like you said but i went and i got a pallet from the back of safeway like a wooden pallet and i put it down on the floor and i put my mattress on it i got this army blanket from this army navy surplus had my blanket and i had this like little lamp and i put a blue light bulb in it which just made it like super cool in there you know i have my little section of books my little section of of cds and and um and so one time my parents came over because they wanted to check out my place because i had been telling them like I got my place, you know, and it's dope. It's like, I got, it's like on the third floor. I got this great view. I got these kind of like cool roommates, you know, and I'm, and uh, so they show up there. And my first thing, my dad had to go take a piss. <laughs> he walks into the bathroom and he sees like the handcuffs hanging up there on the bathroom, uh, on the, on the shower rack. And he just comes out and he's like, didn't he, 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 it was just too much for him to like even say anything. I could just see on his face, like, <laughs> this is too, like, I can't even start even to ask you about what this is about. Man. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> and uh but but it was like it, that to me that time was like everything it was like i'd just get up i was a bike messenger at the time and i'd get up and i'd carry my bike down three flights of stairs and i'd ride my bike and i'd feel that fresh air hit me and it just felt like the world was wide open but it was like everything to me to try to get that whatever it was 167 dollars or something a month to try to like pay the rent there and keep it going but that now I look back on it I'm not about how much fun it was. But at the time, it was just like, just kind of stressful, a little bit weird for my friends and my parents. And, you know, yeah. but it was, it was the golden years, man. Dude. Okay. So, and I mean, the nice thing about, especially mindset is that you can stay in that because as, as everything shifts, so is your perspective. So now it's like, I live with my girlfriend, I have a dog and like even those things like um, of like, you know, oh, do we have enough space and everything? It's like those things can be stressful, but it's also like a beautiful life. You know, I really can't complain yeah. at all. And people enjoy the things that I make, which was something that I couldn't even see back when I was in Chicago. It's like yeah, the, the fact that people enjoy what I make and stuff. I remember you, you just reminded me of this thing. So there's, this is wild. Okay. So (laughs) there was this dude that I like, I don't know, like, yeah, kind of like kind of new, like kind of buddies with and everything. But, uh, he basically was in the same situation like you, except his roommates were doing like a lot of drugs, specifically meth, right? Yeah. And he was just trying to study and like get through school and everything and and he was working and stuff. And (laughs) so he, they would be making so much noise partying that he finally um, started playing these like sort of, they they weren't beats, but it was like music to study to. So it wasn't beats like, you know, like lo-fi chill beats or anything. It was more like binaural beats with like gong music, like just something to zone out on so you can study. meditative, yeah. Yeah, and then eventually after like, I can't remember how long it was, but after a few weeks, his roommate knocked on the door and they were like, hey, uh... (laughs) your music is really bubbling us out and we're trying to do math. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, uh, we can't focus. Oh. Yeah. It's like, we, we cannot enjoy this. Like people are leaving. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, it's such a, it's such a wild thing too, because roommates are like family for the time that a lease is effective, you know? And so yeah. when you, especially when you move in with people that are, just like off like like it you know i only had a handful of roommates in college throughout the years and luckily some of them i'm like still friends with to this day and everything like you make these great connections but yeah when you when you're just like moving out on your own and you got to get like these craigslist roommates or these like uh these like roommates through circumstance it's just it's such a wild thing that we we kind of gloss over it that for survival strangers come together to just like cohabitate yeah. it's 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 like and it's not that it's not a bad thing but it is just wild how if i really had my choice i would never be this person's roommate they're doing meth yeah <laughs> but because i'm in school and because i need to save my money for something else like i'm maybe saving up to get a car or something i'm just gonna study through the fumes and try to <laughs> <laughs> and try to get this degree you just live with whatever comes i remember i had these two roommates well, I remember living in this one place where I was the messy guy, you know, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it, it's all like degrees, you know what I mean? Like, of like, oh, so one roommate really makes sure that the kitchen is like spotless and the bathrooms and the other roommate doesn't put the lid on everything all the time. And there's another roommate who lives, the, leaves the dishes in the sink. Well, for a while, like I was that roommate. Right. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so then I moved out and um, I got with these other two roommates and they were like, Oh man, we're hella lax about it. You know, the man, the dishes and the sink, like, don't worry about it, anything. So I was stoked. You know, I was like, oh, cool, man, some other people. And then the dishes just 
fucking stack up <laughs> and it's like nobody wants to do the dishes there's pots with like burnt spaghetti on them that have just been in there for like a week and like that whole thing of like oh it's cool to just not be the guy who does the dishes it like wore off real quick on me i learned how to do the dishes real quick yeah man it's, it's funny too because you know how the the best thing that i that i find for situations like that is if everybody chips in a little bit of money if they have it and you just have someone come like once a week once every two weeks to like clean for you because it it's yeah. one of those things where it's like all right y'all have the extra money you don't want to do it it's it's creating this weird tension like give somebody money who's not in this situation to just come through and like you know like it, it's it's one of those things that just sort of in a way blesses everybody it's like all yeah. right this person can come in they don't need to deal with us they just like come in they make money they leave we don't have to deal with each other in a way of like well it's your turn or whatever right and i remember my friends actually did that so it was four of them and everyone was a different type of messy so like you said right. there's dishes messy there's clothes messy and then there's yeah. pets messy you know yeah and so between the four of them they they just covered all the ground so their apartment was always a mess and so then they finally uh uh paid someone to come through and they were like paying because they all chipped in it was like a good amount and, and we're talking like you know what 2010 so like adjust for inflation 2010 125 bucks that's like oh, yeah. that's good for like a couple hours of work right yeah and so the the person comes through they clean up and they're like oh why don't we do this sooner this is great like i'm not mad at you you're not mad at me blah 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 right and the place wasn't that big either so it wasn't like this person had to clean a lot but then because they knew a person was coming they really started to let themselves go and so then the next time that the that the uh the person came to clean, they walked in and they pulled one of the roommates aside. They were like, "Oh no, 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 no! This is no. This is." They just kept saying, "This is no." And don't get me wrong, this is not like like. I don't want to misrepresent what was happening here. This is yeah. a person who spoke perfect English. <laughs> this is not like this is not like uh you know me doing an accent or something. This is a person <laughs> that spoke perfect English that just kept saying this is no. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> And then, and then they were like, well, what, like, you know, is there something we could do? Like, we don't want to lose you or anything. <laughs> and she was just like, you, 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 oh, you have to get it together. No, 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 no. And then left. And it was like, <laughs> and they had to like take a good hard look at themselves because they were like, oh, okay, we didn't think like, like clearly it was bad enough for them to get someone to come clean to begin with. Yeah, <laughs> but they they didn't realize once they knew someone else was going to clean it for a fact how much they had yeah. let the apartment go, and I didn't yeah. even go, so I don't even know what it looked like. But the fact that a person just kept saying this is no, yeah, is <laughs> should be on a t shirt. <laughs> it's, it's it's like it's like when a doctor sucks their teeth. They say like, uh, "What was the test like?" You know, the, the, and the doctor goes, <laughs> "Yeah, <laughs> yeah." <like, laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you got to get it together. And they yeah. just left. <laughs> but I mean, it, you know, I think that for, for the most part, for me, the, the, the time in Chicago is, like I said, kind of like romanticized. Stuff. I also experienced a lot of wild stuff because I was like when I was beginning to really date as an adult tell, and stuff like that. Tell me about like when you first started thinking like, man, I, I could maybe do this, you know, like this yeah so okay was there like a moment for you where you f actually felt like hey i did this and man it could turn into something yeah yeah i think okay so basically there was a place that i will not i think it's still around actually but i won't put it on blast because okay. that it is where i had this incredible feeling but it's not a good it's not a good place like it's <laughs> not, like like I'll tell you, I'll tell you a couple of stories about just different places in Chicago, but I'll answer your question first. But basically, um, I was on stage and I was doing this show that was like far too long. It was like way, way too long. We're talking like 25 comics 
yeah. were going up and not like not an open mic like we're talking about a show where yeah. 25 comics are going up so like audience members are changing over like the show is just too long and yeah. i remember i got up there and I, I especially got up there after like a couple people had either done all right or bombed and so in my head you know i'm only like a year in if that and so i'm like man everybody else is bombing I'm, am i about to bomb like you know you just don't even have that confidence yet and so i got up i was doing my jokes and i just remember like wow this is like i think it could honestly be said that it was like the first time at least in my mind that i like killed and mm. as it was happening like as it was happening i got so comfortable that i like rested my elbow on the mic stand for the first time and it was like yeah. not a thing i planned to do it was just something genuinely that i was like really relaxing up there and that's when i was like oh like i'm i'm getting good like i'm still like even in that so much was going through my head while i was like doing my jokes like i don't even know how i stayed present because i was like so many thoughts were going through because it was like people were doubled over and i and i had never experienced that exact thing before it's like i had made friends laugh in high school i had done well at the open mic in college but like like this is real comedy like these people don't yeah. have to be here some of them don't want to be here because like people are also too polite like it, it's the thing that we open the show talking about where it's like if a show is too long people don't know they can just leave like mm. so then they'll actually stay and start having a terrible time rather yeah. than leave when they're done you know and yeah. so so these people like i had turned the room around and i was killing with stuff that i wrote with energy that i was bringing and i was like wow okay i'm getting good and it's still even in, even then didn't occur to me that it could like be my job i was just like oh, okay now i can take what i did here and keep being good and be better and then maybe that'll lead to something like like the practicality of comedy becoming a job really didn't even occur to me until maybe like a year and a half in because that's when i started getting like spot pay and you know getting passed at some clubs and and uh get people would bring me on the road with them for one-nighters and that's when it, i was like oh, okay this can be my job eventually yeah. but that moment was like oh oh i'm like getting good and and uh, good enough to turn a room around good enough to you know really inspire the imagination with something that i wrote and good enough to feel confident on stage because i didn't walk on confident i just like yeah. was like oh this is about to be terrible and then funny enough the way that comedy like builds you like anything like with music like with anything the same way you get built up is how you get humble like very yeah. soon after like that's why yeah. that's why even in my recollection of it I, I hope I'm not giving myself too much credit in that I was thinking that I was getting good and not that I was good because, yeah. okay, so we're talking like maybe three weeks later, same <laughs> show because it's not, I'm not booking good shows. Like I'm not like, yeah. cause I'm not good. So then <laughs> it's like, why would I be booking great shows? And so I'm there again. And this time is worse because this time not only is the show super long, but the Blackhawks are playing. The Blackhawks are are playing for the cup, and I think they won. And yeah. so, what little audience we did have went to the other because it was a place that has multiple bars inside this whole structure. And so yeah. they all went to like watch and celebrate the Blackhawks winning. So now there's almost no audience. Then the show just keeps going, and it's like one in the morning, and. And then uh, it's just like four of us left and there's like this unspoken pact where, all right, we all stayed this long. So we'll all four at least watch each other. Yeah. And this comic goes up. And to this day, I don't know if it was like some Andy Kaufman-esque, like, I don't know if this is a part of a master plan or like, or if she really just like lost her mind straight up. But <laughs> basically she gets up and she just starts crying during her set but like oh. crying and still doing her jokes though so it's like it's like you can't even <laughs> you don't even feel like you can laugh because a person is crying right in front of you but also it's like it's like some of the jokes are like kind of funny like i don't even remember them that well but i just remember all of us just looking at each other and being like what is happening right now <laughs>
<laughs> and she was crying doing these one liners. And so like she would be doing a one liner. And this is a bad example. This wasn't I don't even think this is one of her jokes. Yeah. But she was basically like crying and she was like, Do you ever do you ever notice how <laughs> like a yield sign doesn't just <laughs> say slow down like why <laughs> like why do they do that but then in between the like the punchline of the one liner she would just really like have i don't even know how i can really describe it except like a guffaw like she would just like <gasps> <laughs> and, and then deliver the punchline and we were all just like wait is this is this the funniest thing of all time or is this person actually having a nervous breakdown in front of us <laughs> and then i remember i had to follow her and I just, I bombed. I bombed so deeply. And oh, it, it was bad. And then, like, they, I was doing some other shows that also just weren't good. There's a place that I think this place actually is still going. Uh, so I, I won't mention it either. But basically, there was, there's, a, there's a show slash open mic. So sometimes it's an open mic, sometimes it's a show. But it's next to a strip club. But the strip club that it's next to doesn't allow alcohol. So then your audience are people from the strip club rushing into this bar next door to take a shot and then rush back over to the strip club. So that's the <laughs> only audience you get because this place is also kind of like off the way. And so <laughs> and so I was up there and. This this happened. This okay. This is a while. Like my friend was telling me about this. So a guy was sitting at the bar, and my man at the bar is is like a little bit belligerent. Everything to the point where the bartender is like, "All right, that's it. You cut off, right?" Yeah. And then he goes, "Oh, you think you think that's gonna stop me? You think that's gonna <laughs> stop me?" And then he reaches in his bag, pulls out a beer, shakes it up, and just starts spraying it everywhere. And so then, uh, so then this this guy who is married to this woman who's like an open micer, um, is smaller than me. So we're talking about a tiny man. Sees this whole thing go down and sees the guy try to run out after he sprays the beer everywhere, and yeah. stands in front of the door, crosses his arms, and like full like tough guy '80s movie goes, "Can't let you leave, pal." <laughs> <laughs> and this guy is little and the 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 crazy dude is like easily like six four or something yeah and so then the this guy the crazy guy goes wow you're brave and then he grabbed his collar and his belt buckle and threw him by both <laughs> to the point where little man landed on the bar like he landed oh on the bar and slid like a western <laughs> And so he's just flopping like a fish, like just like, uh, 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 and then that guy runs out. So then they must have called the cops on this dude while he was getting belligerent before he sprayed the beer. Because as yeah. soon as he runs out, the cops run in. And so the cops run in and they're putting flashlights in people's faces. They're grabbing people because they're just trying to figure out who the yeah, who the person who is because they got the description from the call. Right. Yeah. And so at this moment. With dudes trying to get a shot from the the strip club and the cops in there and the comics in there and the bartender and bar back trying to give their statement to the police. This is more people than have ever been in the bar. So then the host is like, we're going to start the show. We're going to start the show. Let's start the show. <laughs> and then tries to start the show yelling over the bartender giving the statement to the police. Like, I just, I just bought a... <laughs> I just bought a new car. It, it was horrible. <laughs> oh, man. You know, in the last few years, well, early during the pandemic, it's been such a challenging time for people, both personally as well as socially. And, 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 and um, you know, just all the social movement and, and progression that we've seen taking place over the last couple of years. You know, as a comic, do you ever sit there and think, man, I got to address this issue? You know, there's something that's happening in the news. Or do you just look at it like, what is it that's inside of your heart that's, that, that, that you're feeling you just speak about? Or, or do you really sit down and go, you know, I think there's something that needs to be said here? I had a lot of feelings about 2020. And, and I yeah. also 
remember when it was going to be a good year. Like, remember January of 20... I don't... The way that people tell it, everybody was about to have a bomb-ass year in 2020 yeah. from January, and then it just started to turn. Yeah. And so I never sit down and say, like, oh, I need to speak on this thing specifically. It's more that if something is sweeping through the culture, you also have an experience with it and you have feelings about it. And that's what I end up pulling from. So it is kind of a dual thing where both with elusive with that mixtape, that comedy and that music is from sort of the year that I had and the arc that it created for me. And then with even my hour special with comedy central, it's like that was just me addressing it because it happened to all of us. And a, and so much comedy comes through shared experience that I think that for the most part, if you have an ultimate shared experience that was like truly global, then you, you have to speak on it and you have to have some feeling about it. You can't, there's no, you'd have to be the most boring person of all time to have no feelings on being locked in your room for a year. Like, like that's, that's wild. And no matter which way those feelings go, it's like you, you must have some opinion, at least on yourself and how you feel about it. And so that was big for me to just try to share my perspective through things that everyone already went through. Because when you do any form of art, you're trying to fight for a little bit of that, that universal connection. And it, it was almost like a cheat code with the year that we just had where it's like, I mean, who didn't who didn't see the protests, who didn't experience some form of uh, a loved one getting sick or uh, of an acquaintance getting sick or just the numbers at large of people that were getting sick. It's like who didn't have some form of anxiety about the election, like people who don't live here were nervous it's it's like that whole thing it felt like um for better or for worse all of 2020 was like us all being locked in one room together because it was also more attention to be paid than ever before like because of lockdown there were stories that probably wouldn't have got the traction had the world been normal that they got through um everyone being in this in this yeah, sort this of quarantine period. The thing that I love about what you do in your comedy and just just your 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 way of presenting ideas and observations is it is very universal, you know, and there's very few comics that I see that tap into that. It's it's kind of like there's comics who do this kind of thing really well and they do this kind of thing really well. And they, it's almost like in music how you have genres, you know, mm -hmm. but I feel like the way that you address things is is very universal and appeals to a super wide swath of of audience and um you're always able to find like the humanity in things even the most absurd things you find the humanity in it and that's my final question to you is what does it mean to you to be human and how do you stay human like in this crazy world how do you hold on to whatever it is that makes you be a human yeah, I mean, thanks, man. I, I appreciate it. I think that for the most part, it's um, I, I hold on kind of like you have this this general. I, I, I wouldn't call it a mantra, but you but you have this like belief that if you yeah. truly know someone and you know their story, you you can't help but love them. And that yeah. love isn't always a cosign on everything they do, but that love is compassion for who they are or who they became. Right. And I think that for me, it's like knowing that the two things that I hold on to the most are kind of in that same vein. And it's where I draw most of the comedy from because I try to write for everybody. And the best way to write for everybody is to really see yourself in everybody. All people, all other people are, are like shades and facets of you. It's why when someone behaves a certain way and you hate it, it's because you hate that thing yourself, you know? Yeah. Um, but for me, I, I hold two basic principles that I try to draw all of my like comedy and all of my, um, I guess, rhetoric. Is, is the right word for it from where every everyone is basically the same mm -hmm. and that's not a, that's not a good or bad thing it just means that like kind of like what you're talking about it's like plug any person into different situations and they'll probably come with the same outcome if if a person that you know 
sure you might be a, a, a successful person, but maybe you had the the background to set you up for success. Not saying you didn't work hard, but like maybe you had parents who instilled hard work in you and then they also gave you, you know, like the financial acumen to to apply that hard work so it wasn't just hard work to a dead end. And that might be why you are where you are. And if you plug in any other scenarios, you might be in a totally different place. I don't think that a person's even strength of character doesn't determine outcome. And so mm. there's there's that. There's the fact that like um, people are basically all the same and that everything is connected. So the way that you treat someone, even in passing, it's like it's like even like, you know, to take it all the way back to the beginning, even when I like left the sandwich shop. I wasn't trying to be a jerk about it. I was just like, this isn't going to end well for anybody. I know my <laughs> man behind the counter can only do as much as he could do with what he has. And he has nasty ingredients, you know, and I know that I don't want to eat a bad sandwich. And I know he would want to serve me a bad sandwich, but here we are. So I'm just going to separate myself from the situation because I could easily be that dude behind the counter being like, come on, man, I already started the sandwich. Just eat it. And it's like, nah, because you wouldn't eat it. You don't eat eat here like that's that's the best way to tell and so i find that knowing that everything is connected and that and that all of these like instances of good good or bad of us crashing together have ripples and those those ripples create you know whole waves that that you could never really see the end of and and so it's why you have to both be gracious with people be careful with yourself and be um a a a accepting and and you know grateful for the the circumstances that you have not just because they could always be worse because they could obviously if they could be worse they could be better but i think that when you're present and when you're honest with yourself and the people around you you can't help but speak in a way that resonates with people and uh you know it was like there was this thing, there was this line from my grandpa. I'm trying to remember what it was, but it, but you know, there, there, it's something to the effect of like, uh, you know, like w you, I'm going to say it wrong, but it's like your words are like a wildfire. So you have to be careful what you spark, you know? And, and I think that f for the most part, holding those two principles is why I, it's why it's important to me to do comedy for everyone. And it's why I think it's working out because obviously I'm not everyone. It's like, I'm, I'm a very specific person and I'm like, and I'm weird on top of that. So even the people that are <laughs> like me, aren't like me. And that's not me pumping myself up. If anything, I kind of wish I was more like them. Like it, like to be, to be weird, isn't always great. And, <laughs> and I find that though, the thing that resonates with people for a different reason in every joke not every joke i tell but a joke that gets different parts of the room for different reasons is trying to catch everyone along the way it's like carpooling you know it's like some people are with you from the beginning of the joke some people just like the funny noise that you made some people like the story some people like the way it ended but like if we all end up in the same place where we're all enjoying ourselves and we see how um how alike we are then i feel like i've done my job wow that's awesome man Hey, um, I, I just feel really just honored and, and blessed to have met you in this way. And I, I look forward to many, many decades of your art, both in, you know, working with music. I hope you get involved in film and, and writing in other ways. Um, and uh, folks can find you at joshjohnsoncomedy.com. And I suggest highly that you follow him on instagram because there's there's so much great stuff and he's a josh johnson comedy also on instagram so josh thank you so much for being here on the stay human podcast and uh what have you got next what's the next couple things that people can look forward to so starting august 11th my comedy central special hashtag is going to be on paramount plus so it'll be on demand anytime that you want to watch it and you can also check out Elusive, the mixtape that I put together with my friends and everything. It's on Which Spotify, awesome. anywhere you listen to music. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. And then, uh, like you said before, you were kind enough to plug all my things, so I'm just replugging them. I'm only repeating the things <laughs> that you said. But um, my podcast, The Josh Johnson Show, comes out every Thursday, and it's wherever you listen to podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, all those places. 
Awesome. That's uh, Josh Johnson, y'all. And this is the Stay Human Podcast. And we will see you next week right here. Thank you, Gibson Guitars. Peace. Peace.